I have eight influential nonfiction books on this list, and these are books that are part of my permanent collection. I recommend them often, and I've reread all or parts of all of them in various times. I was talking with a friend of mine not too long ago, and we were mentioning movies, documentaries, and books. And like most people, we really only look at movies or, or documentaries or books for that matter once. And we remember them well, and the ones that are memorable, of course, stay in permanent memory. But there are a very select few that make, let, let's call it the Pantheon, and their books. In this case, I've isolated some nonfiction books, history books, and some recent history books that are books that I will pick up and reread parts, things that will jog my memory. I'll remember parts from these books to either rewrite the historical record for myself or to remind people where to go. And I have them as go-to books for various parts of current affairs, American or world history. So let's get started and take a look at which ones I've chosen that are in what would be called the pantheon of books on my shelf. The first one is When Pride Still Mattered, and this is The Life of Vince Lombardi. And it's by David Moranis, and it's, it's a book that's exceedingly unique because not only is it the life of Vince Lombardi, the iconic Green Bay Packer coach, but it also lets you into a world that is gone, an American culture that for a lot of ways and a lot of aspects is no longer around. And Vince Lombardi was the, uh, an Italian immigrant, uh, son of Italian immigrants, and his family lived in Brooklyn. And they didn't, they didn't have that much. I mean, his grandfather from Italy was a barber. His father was a worker in the meatpacking district, and he was raised in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. They didn't have anything at all, and yet this kind of short, squat Italian man made it to the pinnacle in the professional football world. The winner of the Super Bowl to this day wins the Vince Lombardi Trophy, and Vince Lombardi was part of an America that was, it's difficult to say, it was, was it better? Probably, uh, it was more free, but it was also a lot more harsh. And when I say that, what I'm talking about is Lombardi was a college star, a lineman back at Fordham University. And what happened was he became a lineman and was very good. And then when college was over, that was it. I mean, he didn't get any special dispensation. He wasn't good enough to play professional football. He played semi-pro football. And you know what he became? He became a small Catholic school, high school football coach. St. Cecilia's in northern New Jersey. And he was a high school football coach and part-time basketball coach for years, around seven years. He was a nobody. And now he was a very good high school coach. They went on a winning streak that was out of this world. But he wasn't anyone special. He didn't have any inroads necessarily to a higher level. He became, you know, like thousands of other people, just a regular high school coach. And what happens when you look at this book and you read it is you realize that the gaps in, in generations can be explained through a lens in a book like this. I was in graduate school and I had an uh, an older professor, and he said that, he, and he recommended this book, and what he said was he needed to understand why he couldn't really quite understand his father and why when his grandfather was still alive, he couldn't, they, they couldn't blend, right? They, they just had these certain misunderstandings, and the Lombardi book does that because the generation from when Lombardi sprang pride and your word and hard work, they weren't punchlines. They weren't things that were just used as talking points. It actually, they actually did matter. And so what you have in this book is an amazing journey in, uh, in an America, 20s, 30s, 40s, and then Lombardi becomes an assistant coach after his high school coaching. Uh, he becomes an assistant coach 
at West Point. Then he becomes an assistant coach at also um, in, for the New York Giants. And that really was the door that opened because you have another gap in knowledge from Vince Lombardi as a New Yorker. And then what happens is he gets the offer to be the Packer coach. And then the history begins because he takes all of his things that worked as a coach, got, he has got rid of all the things that didn't work, and what he does is he takes them and a complete a franchise that's completely reeling, the Green Bay Packers, he takes them and they become multiple world champions. And it's an amazing story of what one guy in a in America where there's there are very few safety nets was able to do. I recommend this book, of course, very highly. This book I thought about putting first, but I wanted to move the directions around in the presentation. And Carnage and Culture by Victor Davis Hanson is a in effect a list each chapter recounts landmark battles and the rise of Western power. Hansen's premise is that the Western way of war, the Western ethos, in effect, the Western frame of mind, the Western attitude is really what has enabled people like Cortez in the 1520s and Alexander the Great and the Marines in Vietnam, that the Western way of war, dating back to the ancient Greeks, has enabled the West to win major battles and was the catalyst for the rise of Western power. The chapter that I enjoy in this book the most is the one uh, with Cortez. Cortez goes in in, 15, in the early 1520s into the Aztec Empire and, and Tenochtitlan, which was a lake city and the capital of the Aztec Empire. It's now Mexico City and the lake is filled in. But he goes and what he does is he almost gets killed. He almost gets himself and his men killed. The, the chapter begins, they're stuck in one of the buildings in Tenochtitlan, unable to get out. And Cortez engineers an escape. And it costs him a large percentage. At least a third of his men are killed. He barely survives, right? They're sneaking out at night from this building. They have nothing else to do. They're going to get starved out. They're going to all die. So Cortez, of course, does a nighttime escape in Tenochtitlan. The story goes there's a washerwoman who sees them and sounds the alarm. And then they have to really hustle out of there. And they take huge losses. And here's one of the key parts of the the ethos, the mindset of Western way of battle is Cortez just gets decimated. His troops get killed and he and a, a fraction of his forces barely escape. And the Aztec way of battle was to celebrate the victory. It wasn't to continue to chase them out of the empire and down towards Veracruz where they were going. It was to celebrate the victory. And that was that image, that celebration in the Aztec way of war cost them because what happens is Cortez goes back to Veracruz, has his top engineer, Martin Lopez, build in dry dock three boats for the lake battle that he was going to then do, has them disassembled, and then they carry with the aid of allies, the Tlaxcalans and others, back up to Tenochtitlan, rebuild the boats in dry dock, launch them in Lake Texcoco, and that summer you have the end of the Aztec Empire. And if they had chased Cortez down, they would have killed him and his men, and the Aztec Empire would have lasted longer, maybe stayed permanently, but they didn't. And that's Hansen's point. Many, many little things like that are shown in the book. And each chapter has lists of just incidences that, you know, could be easily explained away with weapons or 
with technology, but Hansen goes further and explains how it's the culture, it's the mindset, it's the lessons learned, starting with the phalanx in Greek and Roman times, and those ways are the ones that win. The other one is you have the British in Africa and the defeat uh, of the Zulu Empire, same kind of thing, where you've got the the British army and their ways of thought and their ways of battle takes down the the even though they're over they're they're outmanned by thousands they actually win um, Rourke's Drift is the other chapter in the book that I highly recommend I read this book with students every chance I get and the reason why I read the narrative life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. This is, of course, written by himself, and it's the earliest one. There are there are at least three versions of Douglass' biography. I should say autobiography. And I read the first one with students in particular because he's young, impressionable, and he's also an illiterate, semi-escaped slave in the Baltimore area. And not only does it walk you through his thought process, it shows you what was going on in those days. And it really is one of these books where you step into a time warp. You can watch well done documentaries in, during slavery times that are, you know, that where the subject of the documentary is a slavery time in the United States. Reading the first edition of Douglas' autobiography, you really step into a time warp. It's, it's like being on the streets of Baltimore, no electricity, no internal combustion engines, everything driven by horse or mule, and uh, you have uh, slaves, you have escaped slaves, you have freed slaves, you have white people in Baltimore, and you have the children, and this is really one of the key parts because you have a young Frederick Douglass, and he, as a young boy, was looking around and realizing the huge amount of inconsistency in the world around him. Now he could not read, but he knew that there was power in it. It just is just his own young intuition. And it's quite amazing because what he figured out was that his he was kind of lent out to a, a, another master. He's a young boy still. And the master's wife, this woman, felt sorry for him and started to teach him how to read. And her husband, is furious at her doing this. And Douglas, as a young boy, realizes that there's something to it. Right there, he realizes, wait a minute, if this guy does not want me to know how to read, there must be something to that. And that spark, that little bit of intuition, opened up everything. And so what happens was she stops teaching him how to read, and then what he does is he kind of challenges the other little boys, black and white, in the area, because they're kind of street urchin type kids, white and black, right? These poor white kids running around. They don't have anything either. They're all trying to figure out get, where to get food and how to hustle and how to make things happen. And it's, it's an amazing slice of Americana from his viewpoint. And what he does, especially with the younger white kids is he challenges them. He says, yo, I can read better than you can. And they, of course, are, you know, laughing in his face. And he challenges them and he takes some losses. You know, he, he, he couldn't read that well. But when they would show what they could do, when they would read stuff in front of him to prove him wrong, he would take those as lessons. And he was willing to take the loss because he knew at the end, and this is a little boy, mind you, that he would eventually learn how to read. And what happened was he figured things out and was able to become an American titan in the anti-slavery movement and just as a speaker. And I challenge you, go look at his speeches. You can read the texts even today. You can find them for free, PDF'd. And what this man became from his beginnings it shows you why he said the things he did when people would ask him, well, don't you think this is, you know, when he was an older guy, they'd ask him, what do you think should be done 
with the black population, and he said, do nothing. We can handle it. And when you look at his young life, you can understand why he said things like that. This is a book I've gone to maybe more than all the others. John Taylor Gatto was another regular guy. He was an English teacher in the middle schools in District 3 in Manhattan, IS-44. He was at um, uh, Booker T. Washington Middle School, which is on 102nd Street, 101st Street, uh, just off of Amsterdam Avenue between Columbus and Amsterdam. And he was an English teacher, a uh, junior high school student. And what happened was, after years of teaching, and he fell into the profession. He didn't go out into the world as a young man in his 20s to teach. He did it on a, just on, on a whim. And what he did was he started to look around and he at first compared his teaching, or I should say his schooling, in, as a young man in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, and the kind of education that the children in the city were getting in New York City, starting when he started when he started teaching in the '60s, and he realized the insane amount of discrepancy in quality of teaching and style, and just kind of rote rule following. And so he spent about ten years writing the Underground History of American Education, which is aptly called an intimate investigation into the prison of modern schooling. Now, I'm a high school English teacher, and you see words like the prison of modern schooling, and at first you think, okay, this is just hype. This is just someone who's completely overdosed on um, his craft and just doesn't get it. I disagree. This is one of the more amazing books you'll read. And what he did in analyzing the institution itself, he was watching what his teaching, what his schools, where he was working, what it was, what was being created, and it didn't make any sense. You had a bunch of young people being taught to follow orders and to bow down before an authority. Now, those are logical fallacies. Simply because someone has a suit on or is behind a lectern or has a set of credentials does not guarantee that the person is smart or telling you the truth or guiding you the right way. It's possible, but what schooling does is breed complacency and inability to think for yourself and a reliance on others, kind of a learned helplessness. And Gatto proves that school in America was started to do just that. Now, I know that sounds a little out there, but when you look at Prussian school, and this is what John Dewey went to go look at and analyze, among others, he's not the only guilty party, but what they did was they saw the Prussian model of schooling, starting with kindergarten, children's garden, to grow and foster vegetables, human vegetables, if you will. It was built so that you can have obedient soldiers and obedient factory workers. And that's why it was put in. And if you can have, if you have an independent thinking electorate, if you have an independent thinking, rabidly thoughtful, intellectually curious population, it's exceedingly difficult to rule over people like that. And the Austrians, and Prussians, really, it's kind of a Prussia, Austrian, German institution, they figured it out. And they started school, Schule in German. And it was brought to the United States because at the time you had a literate population that was fantastically independent and would not simply agree to what an elected official said. They're like, no, you work for us. You do what you're going to do. Leave us alone to be free. Your job is in the Constitution simply to uh, enforce the sanctity of contracts and help guarantee the freedom of American citizens. That is, in Article 1, Section 8, basically the list of things you can do as a federal government. And don't come near me with other stuff. 
And the people who took down the United States needed people to be simply thoughtless, rule-following drones. And I, it's kind of cynical and a little bit of a black pill, but that's what school has done. And so what you've got is uh, Gatto's expose of the foundation of school in American culture. And I'll leave you with this small anecdote that I use all the time because you can look at these things. Uh, the previous book with Frederick Douglass, look at how he spoke. Frederick Douglass never went to a proper school, yet he became a titan of literacy and speech. Act, his active literacy skills, speaking being the main one and writing being the other one, are off the charts. In theory, Frederick Douglass should not exist. In the 1820s, Last of the Mohicans was a best-selling book. There was no organized school in America in the 1820s. Have you ever read Last of the Mohicans? You don't even have to go that far back. Look at the uh, stuff that's written in the McGuffey readers. Those are textbooks. Go online and, and look at them and you'll see what the real America used to consider educational and compare that to your fifth graders textbooks. And you'll realize that the underground history of American education, schools which now produce rule following mostly thoughtless Americans is doing exactly what it was intended to do. And that's the crime of the whole thing. And Gatto proves it. I hope his message continues to resonate and only grows over the next few years. This book, Until Proven Innocent, is noteworthy as well. It is political correctness and the shameful injustices of the Duke Lacrosse rape case. And I picked this one because I have gone back to it. I've used it in class. You'll see why I parallel it with the shameful Scottsboro Boys incident back in the olden days in the 1930s. Because you have in America, in theory, when you step into court, you are innocent until proven guilty. And what happened in the Duke lacrosse case in 2005, uh, I believe it was early 06, this whole thing started, you have the idea that these three young men at Duke, they played lacrosse on the team, that they were guilty. And they were guilty in the court of public opinion, in the press, on that campus from professors. They were guilty and they had to be proven innocent, which at they were, which at initially, at the, well, at, initially they weren't, and then by the end of this whole fiasco, they were proven innocent. The Attorney General of the state of North Carolina had to declare them innocent, which should be repellent to anybody who is an American. And what you have is the Duke lacrosse team had a, like a stag party, and they hired a woman to dance for them. And a lot of people would start off with, hey, that's really a bad thing. That's kind of you know, demeaning to women, and it's a bad idea. And okay, but the Duke basketball team had done the same thing uh, not too far, not too long before that. And so and the initial complaint was, hey, look at these terrible guys and their the terrible habits. And that's so ridiculous that they would do such a thing. And then people would, of course, bring up that the basketball team had done it too, and then that line of attack ended and then the political correctness took over and it was a shameful injustice and it, i use this as kind of the beginning of the repellent and just awful political correctness now we call it woke culture on campuses and i'm going to read a short blurb from john grisham the legal novelist at the first the top of the first page he says Brutally honest, unflinching, exhaustively researched, and compulsively readable, Until Proven Innocent exoriates those who led the stampede, the prosecutor, the cops, the media, but it also exposes the cowardice of Duke's administration and the faculty. Until Proven Innocent smothers any lingering doubts that in this country the presumption of innocence is dead, dead, dead. That's John Grisham. That's the first blurb for the book. And he's right because you have the awful, lying, disgusting corporate press 
who told the United States that these three young men at Duke, because they were white and wealthy or reasonably wealthy lacrosse players, were rapists, criminals, and should be locked away for the rest of their lives. And you know what it was based on? Based on nothing. They didn't do anything. None of the charges were true. The local attorney, a guy named Mike Nifong, who's been disbarred, he concocted the whole thing. And the reason why Grisham talks about the cops as well, because normally cops are just regular people. They're just guys trying to do their job. Not in this case. They went against procedure. They set up things that in, were intended for these uh, guys to fail. And the anti-white sentiment, right? These are, in, the, in, the, in the Scottsboro case in the 30s, it was, well, look at these young black kids. Of course, they're, uh, they, they molested those young women, right? They're young black kids on a train. That was the 1930s America. Well, 70 years later, now you have, well, look at these rich white kids. It's obvious they're just guilty because they play lacrosse and they're wealthy and they're white men. And the just unbelievably shameful behavior of the students, the faculty, the people who run Duke, or I should say the university formerly known as Duke University, because I don't know what's going on down there now. What it's done is it's made people I know think that something happened, where it was physically impossible that any of these guys did anything to Crystal Mangum, the woman who uh, accused them of rape. And so even with no evidence, the corporate press, the administration of the college, they kept pushing until they couldn't push anymore. And they almost destroyed these guys' lives. To some degree, they may have. If you Google search any one of these people, you do any kind of internet search, you're probably going to come up, and you search their names, the first thing that's going to come up is this rape case. So you really see a lens into woke culture. This was one of the catalysts that showed people what the deal was, and this book isn't talked about enough. I recommend you read it, especially if you're either going to go into a university setting or you have children who are going to go into a university. You need to look at this book to see what you're getting into. This book shows you, and this is kind of a total different topic from the previous book, but The Great Bridge by David McCullough is the epic story of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And like the other books, you step into a different world. The Brooklyn Bridge construction began in the 1860s, and it was finished in the 1880s. So you have the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. And I want you to think about this carefully. The Brooklyn Bridge is structurally sound. It's functional today. It was not only the tallest structure in New York at the time, the two towers, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world by a lot. It's an amazing story. They did not have electricity. They didn't have engines. They had simply a, and they didn't have any government help. One of the things about the building of this bridge is you learn how things got done before you had an, a gigantic government everywhere and people had to do things kind of on their own. They had to get permits. They had to talk to local organizations. Brooklyn was its own city at the time. Manhattan was New York City at the time. They had to get those two small governments to talk. They had to get permission. They had to figure out how to get materials. How are we going to pay for it? It was a completely different United States. And if you want to know what the United States was like in one of the largest cities in the country right after the Civil War, this book will show you. It's an amazing look into what was once a free America because what you have are the Roeblings who were spectacularly gifted engineers of German descent. And you can see how they came up with plans, how they got the idea started, 
who they had to talk to, how they had to raise funds, and the engineering is amazing. They had these amazing, gigantic, basically wooden barges, airtight, and they would sink them, and then they would send people down into the barge, under the water, and then eventually under the dirt as they would dig through the dirt so that these hollow, gigantic wooden boxes were then sitting on granite, on bedrock. And then when they got all the dirt out, the guys would come up and then they filled those wooden barges. They're in effect almost like wooden boxes with concrete. And then they built the towers on top of that. Underwater, no engines, no electricity. There were some deaths. It's where people figured out what the bends were when you get a gas buildup in your uh, body from uh, the different pressurizations. You're right. You're under so much air pressure down there, and you come up too fast, you get you get hurt. And and Roebling himself was more partially paralyzed for the rest of his life, and had to just direct the project from his room via his wife. And they built the bridge, this disabled man, with the help of his amazing wife and their engineering knowledge, completed a titanic project in a completely different United States. The engineering aspect of it, the lens into America at the time, it really is one of these books that, lets, that, that, that teaches you in a way that a textbook or a video documentary cannot. McCullough went into the Roebling's papers up at RIT and organized them and collated them and then went through all of them and created this amazing book. It's highly, highly recommended. As a New Yorker, I had to put this one on the list because of my New York City roots, but also I've gone back to look at parts of this book repeatedly. The Power Broker by Robert Caro is the definitive Robert Moses and the Fall of New York story. And it's called The Fall of New York because, and it won the Pulitzer Prize because it's, I think it's 1,200 pages of one person's power grab. Robert Moses wasn't anything special necessarily, I and mean, he went to Yale. He was a smart guy, and he had plans to be a, like a city planner. And he turned into, into all the people who can lay claim to the shaping of New York and New York City. Robert Moses, who was never a politician, has to be on the list. He's going to maybe, and some people put him number one. And what Caro says in, in writing this book, when you listen to him talk about this book, is he was a reporter at Newsday, and he kept hearing that uh, Robert Moses, who was the commissioner of the uh, Port Authority, or he was the commissioner of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or he was the head of the Upstate Power Authority, and he kept Hearing Moses as the guy who was giving sound bites and in control of all of these authorities. And so Carol was wondering, well, what's an authority? And then he started wondering, how is Robert Moses the head of all of these authorities? I mean, this guy has an unbelievable amount of power. And he did. And for 30 to 40 years, 40 years in um, New York City, 30 years in New York State, Robert Moses you could make the argument that he ran the state. He was such a powerful man. And his love affair with highways and cars and expressways and parkways really did help take down a lot of what New York used to be about. And, you know, people are always wondering how does someone get power? What's the lure of power? How do people keep it? Here you have a, you know, nothing, a kind of a nondescript guy, graduate of Yale, who went into city planning. It didn't work. He actually got ousted 
he was a good government guy and he got ousted by Tammany Hall and the political machine. And he was, he was the, you know, at one point before he became uh, uh, an employee of um, Alfred E. Smith, he was online in Cleveland trying to get a public service job with hundreds of other guys. And he became Robert Moses, the most powerful guy in New York State. And how did that happen? And here's the thing that's interesting, is a lot of people talk about money is power. And to some degree, they're right. But the Robert Moses story throws that concept into the garbage. Robert Moses was never very wealthy. He seemed to not be concerned with money at all. He lived okay, but... He was an extremely powerful person. And if you want to parallel this book with one of the old Western classics, Machiavelli's The Prince and Robert Moses in The Power Broker, there are some real parallels there because this guy had a thirst for power and figured out how to get it. And then he figured out how to hold on to it. And his manipulation of the press, which manipulated the minds of the people, and the way people spoke about him really helped him control New York City and New York State for decades. And he was never a politician, and he was just a regular guy who was really bright and figured it out. It is a book unlike any other. I put this book last on purpose. The Illusion of Victory by Thomas Fleming. And it is the definitive World War I revisionist history book. I put that one in there because it's a book on America in World War I. Now, what people don't realize, what Americans don't realize, is that, as usual, the story you get for World War I is not, uh, 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 is not the real story. How, I mean, how many times have I said in front of students, do you want the real story or do you want the fake story? And, you know, the fake story is usually the story that is told in the history book. The... You know, Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and it ignited the world into a world war and everybody fought and the good guys won. And that's so far from the truth, it's not even funny. And what Fleming does in this book, what he did in writing The Illusion of Victory, not only got him kicked out of the conservative author group, right? Tom Fleming was kind of a conservative Republican author. And he got kicked out of the club because he told too much truth, right? How dare you talk about America and Britain in anything but a flattering light? Fleming takes this pre, particularly, I want to tell you about the pre-World War I story. He takes that story and gives it to you. And you realize how shameful and venal and disgusting a lot of the behavior was of the people in charge of Britain and then the United States in order to get the United States to get America in World War I. Remember, World War I was a European affair, and the British and the French were getting their teeth kicked in by the Germans. And what started was a propaganda campaign that probably in scope had never been done before. You finally had you had uh, cables, you had an early wireless communication system with Marconi, uh, uh, what we like an early version of radio. And the propaganda that was sent out from Europe to the United States in order to get America involved was out of this world. Conservatively, 80% of the United States did not want to go into World War I. That was not an American war. If Europe is going to go fight among itself, okay. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. Americans knew this. And America had been taught correctly that it shouldn't go overseas in, searches, in search of monsters to slay, in the old John Quincy Adams quote. And the 80% conservatively did not want to go into war. And those Americans let their elected officials know this. And what Fleming does, and the, one of the key parts of the book, is the, the, within the first 70 pages, you get chapter and verse on the propaganda campaign that was used to whip Americans into a frenzy. And the 
cutting corners and cheating and underhanded activities done by the large banks and the government officials in Britain and the United States. I even have the word propaganda. I hand wrote it here on page 45. Um, you'll also see that things like this. Let me give you a short example. Uh, on page 44, you have uh, London taking up, literally bringing a, a ship, the Telconia was a boat, and it went into the ocean and it had grappling hooks and it, it it says here grappling hooks that enabled the ship to retrieve malfunctioning cables from the sea bottom for repairs down slid the grapplers into the cold gray depths and soon one by one the five mud covered sheaths of copper covered wires were hauled aboard and i underline this part this next part in the book each was hacked apart and dropped back into the sea Henceforth, Germany could communicate securely with the Western Hemisphere only through a subsidiary cable that ran from Liberia to Brazil, a line that was largely U.S. owned. Meaning, what they did, what Britain did, was cut, literally cut the information cable that could have sent information from Germany directly to the United States because Germany wasn't doing what Britain said it was doing, right? Britain was doing the classical stuff you see now, where they're saying, well, they're taking babies with pitchforks and they're flinging them into uh, gigantic bonfires. None of that was happening. The campaign against the Hun, they did the same thing in World War II. All of this stuff was done with the British press, and then the American press continued. And at first, American reporters were enraged that their writings were edited or blocked. And you have, uh, and this is really the thing that shook me awake with this book. Not only is it one of the nails in the coffin of a once free America, but you see what people are willing to do to get a country into war, simply because they benefit by getting power and money. And Britain and France were going to lose. And so, you know what, if you need to bring in the United States, and you need to make sure that the 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 you know the the president at the time Woodrow Wilson, who was a spineless loser in this affair, Wilson one of the worst presidents, maybe the worst president in American history, he simply bent the knee in front of the J.P. Morgan interests and the bankster interests who were going to lose. Um, if you need to kill a few hundred thousand Americans so that your aims are met. So be it. In the illusion of victory, and I know that sounds a little out there. Again, I'll use that phrase. It is the case that you have America dragged into World War I against its will, propagandized to the hilt, and in effect uh, uh, knocked down. I mean, America brought to its knees what was a reasonably free America was ruined forever with World War I. And it took massive forces to do it. And there actually was a backlash. In the 20s, there was a backlash against what happened in World War I. It's been completely written out of the history books, but people were offended what, they, what had been done to them. And 100,000 deaths so that the large banker interests who took control of Britain and the United States so that they could have what they wanted and the progressive era which really was just a command and control group of people they're like well look if we can do that kind of command and control economy and methodology during war let's do that during peacetime and they it, they they almost pulled it off with World War 1 they eventually did after World War 2 but it's a, it's a lens into a, a, it's one of these tipping points in American history. And Fleming walks you through the early parts of European World War I, what was happening then, how America was dragged into it, and how it eventually, in theory, right, you're told, oh, the good guys, the West, the, the Americans and the British and the French, they won World War I. They were victorious. And Fleming says, no, it was the illusion of victory. And he was right.
And this is the book you want to go to to learn why. Thank you, and let's talk again soon.